Today, we're going to speak about something that has been looming of us for quite some time now, the pandemic, right? As just uh, mentioned and introduced, the pandemic that we're speaking about, it's not what you're thinking in mind instinctively, not the COVID pandemic, but something called the mental health pandemic. So we've been going through this for quite a while. Some people call it and term it the silent pandemic. And the key thing here is that this is not a recent phenomenon. Mental has been a huge struggle for many people across the world and particularly so in Asia. And through the last two years in the COVID pandemic, one of the few silver lines is that there's been a lot more talk about the mental health issues that we're facing and going through during the past two years. And that's a great thing. We're getting a lot more conscious about how everyone has our own mental health struggles, big or small, and how we need to make increasingly bigger efforts to tackle this. But make no mistake, having awareness about the mental health uh, pandemic and issues going on isn't the end goal, but actually just the starting point. And we're going to talk a bit more about how for the longest time, um, and particularly so more critical in recent um, periods of time that we're going through today, the mental health pandemic is something that we need to address a lot more so. And today's talk is going to cover four key things. The first things first is that I'm going to touch on how uh, I'm going to shed some light about the state of the mental health crisis that we're going through, particularly so in Asia. What are the barriers that we're seeing? The second thing is I'm going to share a bit more about how we can all view the mental health spectrum um, in a much more uh, open light as well, one that actually relates to all of us. The third thing that we're going to do is going to share a bit more about my own story uh, to really tie it all into a much more everyday manner um, through mental health. And last but not least, I'm going to share how each of us and every one of us, no matter whether you're a student, uh, an employee, a leader, what part you can play, and all of us has a part to play to change the mental health pandemic here. So we're going to start with some stats about the state of the mental health crisis in Asia. The first key thing is that for the longest time, one in five people uh, have struggled with a diagnosable civil mental health disorder. And this is based on a large scale study uh, pre the pandemic. And that's a huge amount of people. One in five of us actually go through this. Quite alarmingly, since the pandemic um, has happened, or since the coronavirus pandemic has happened, uh, that number has increased by quite a few magnitudes to one in three people, right? So one in three people today since the pandemic started, has a form of mental health struggle, be it severe stress, anxiety, or different more niche conditions as well. And this is quite, quite an alarming step because I, I like to touch on how, despite people struggling, the more alarming thing is that 60% of people who go through a mental health struggle do not actually get uh, treated or get support, right? And oftentimes mental health struggles are a lifetime chronic matter. It doesn't just come and go just like the fever you have. It actually persists and stays with people, which affects the quality of life. So this is a big issue in terms of how the state of mental health is with many of us. And I know some of us have heard these stats, but it isn't front and center enough. One of the big things I'd like to highlight to really normalize how we view mental health. Despite a high rate of uh, number of people struggling with diagnosable mental health conditions, I like to highlight that everyone experiences an undiagnosable mental health struggle at some point in their lives, myself included. This could be things like waking up feeling lousy, feeling burnt out at work or at school, or having struggles with um, different types of grief and, and, and loss that we have in our lives as well. Everyone at some point would have our own struggles, and I don't think this is news to any of us. So why is it then in that case that many of us are shying away from the topic of mental health or seeking support, where many of us go through these struggles day in and day out, but don't get the support as easily as we like to do it? So we're going to touch on this a bit more today. I'd like to cover how we should look at the mental health in a way that's a lot more open, accepting, and in actual fact, how it actually is. So mental health is on the spectrum. And simply put, there are three categories, the healthy range, the stress range, and the clinical range. The issue so far in a lot of what we've seen is that mental health has been perceived as a clinical struggle, not just in Asia, but globally, but a lot more partly so in uh, the culture of the Asian context here. We have seen mental health as clinical struggles with trauma, severe depression, and the like. These are very real struggles that we need to address 
But the key thing here is that many of us are also on the spectrum in different buckets of it. And most importantly, many of us are in the middle category, the moderate to high stress range. We face things like burnout, anxiety, sleep issues, relationship struggles. And these are things that are very real struggles that affect how we live, how we behave, how we feel. But oftentimes, we don't get the support or know how to seek the support to address this. So a key thing here is that mental health applies to all of us. It isn't a black or white matter. It's oftentimes gray. We move across the spectrum depending on what we're going through in lives. When we're going through something particularly stressful or something big has happened in our lives, for better or for worse, we may fall into a different um, category of the spectrum, but we can always move back. And oftentimes, what I like to highlight is that it isn't an illness, it isn't a sickness. We all go through this in many ways as well. So I'd like to share a bit more about my own personal journey when I was a teenager. Um, today itself, I am the founder and CEO of a mental health company, but much more before that, I am born and raised uh, as, as, a, as a student and as a, a Singaporean in Singapore, right? So a big part of my journey has been really not just through work, but also personally on the mental health end of things as well. I've had my own journey with mental health since I was in secondary school. So coming back to that piece there, Across my earlier years as a student, I actually went through chronic anxiety uh, for many years, and I never really knew what it was. There was an issue until I was 16, where I had my first panic attack, um, and that's when it felt very real. It was a huge moment of, of uh, helplessness and, and, and fear, and uh, I just didn't know how to handle it. Thankfully, after that instance and, and, and that, that episode, I went to see a therapist. I got the support of my family and, and the people that cared for me to seek support. And I count myself lucky. I started working with therapists when I was 16 and across the years, periodically worked with my, my therapist to, to get support. But the key thing here is that my journey evolved along the whole way. While initially I started with a mental health struggle pertaining to anxiety, um, I learned to manage it and eventually my journey with my therapist went from coping towards developing who I was. And a very big revelation I got was if people knew what therapy was about, if they knew how every day, how, how um, effective it was to supporting our, our everyday needs and lives, everyone will be on it. That was a key revelation I had. And across the years since, I also found that a lot of my peers, my friends, my, my loved ones also had their struggles, sometimes big, sometimes small. But we just bottled it up, and that was a big issue. So this led me to actually starting a mental health company to solve a problem that I faced. One that I hoped could change how mental health was perceived, and one that I hoped would change how people could seek and access support across Asia. So I'm going to share a bit more about how we did this and what we did, and how eventually I have a big, big belief and mission that everyone has a part to play to changing the mental health pandemic in the region. So first and foremost, fast uh, backtracking back not too long ago in, in April of 2020, just at the start of the pandemic, um, after months of building and, and, and researching, we launched into like the mental health company I founded to change how mental health care was done. The mission is quite simple. We wanted to give an easy way for everyone to seek support for their mental well-being, no matter how big or how small across Asia. And we started with that with a self-care app backed by a lot of science, a lot of research that allowed us to do just that. This grew quite exponentially, uh, much to our surprise and our, much to our, our delight as well. We saw huge demand and interest for what Intellect did. Within less than a year, Intellect grew in skill with our, our mental health app to reach over 1 million users um, during 2020 itself. And at that juncture, we saw that this was actually quite a resounding result in, in, in us addressing a very real pain point. People needed support and they wanted it to be relatable and accessible. And that's what we did. We closed our first round of institutional funding and really had big events to change how the landscape of mental health care is. Fast forward not too long later and earlier this year, we've grown and scaled quite exponentially. Today itself, Intellect is Asia Pacific's largest mental health startup. We serve over 3 million lives worldwide on their mental health journeys. Now, not only covering self-care and programs, we support people with live professionals from coaches to psychologists and psychiatrists within minutes across the APAC region. Um, 
I believe what we've seen over the last few years is a very strong testament that what we're trying to tackle, it's a very real need and pain point. People need support, but need to find a way to easily access it. So how do we make this happen? Within a very short span of time, how, can, how do we actually grow and scale a mental solution to address such a big need and such a large scale of population? We have a few theories about how we actually make this happen. First thing first, we spend a lot of time before building anything that we're doing to understand what the problem was. The key thing we realized is that after spending uh, a lot of time and researching on, on, on this matter, we, we, got, we, we gathered thousands of respondents on what we surveyed and we deduced it into a very single, very simple, single problem statement. Many people in Asia need mental support, but do not know how or where to get started for a variety of reasons, right? There is barriers of cost. Mental health care isn't the most uh, affordable or cheapest form of care. There's a huge amount of stigma. And also there's the issue of infrastructure not being built for mental health care to be easily accessed. So we had two big things we wanted to do. And this is today embedded in our mission for what we do at Intellect as well. The first key thing is that we need to increase awareness and normalize conversations. This is a critical piece that we believe was foundational and would never stop, but will only keep going. More people needed to be aware of mental health, what it means, how it relates to all of us, and we need to infuse and, and incorporate this into our daily, everyday conversations. We believe fundamentally that mental health is as important and as relevant as our physical health, but it isn't yet as easily spoken about as such. When we're sick, for example, we would see the doctor for fever, for, for flu. When we're not sick, when we're healthy, we go to the gym, we have diets, we have exercise, we have yoga. Where's the equivalent of that for our mental health, right? When we're mentally unwell, we go and see a therapist, but when we're mentally well, we just do nothing about it. So that's a big thing about what we wanted to do there. Normalizing this in everyday conversations. The second key thing is that we wanted to lower the barriers to care. We wanted to not just lower the barriers, but to build care that is suitable for everyday needs and everyone's daily experiences. So we needed to change how people perceive it, right? So a lot of what I mentioned earlier, mental health isn't just a clinical issue. Mental health is on a spectrum with everyday matters and even a healthy range of things that we can proactively build our resilience around as well. We needed to change and build a way that could lower the cost to care, to make it a lot more instantly accessible through technology. And that's what we did, right? And the very, very last key thing is that we broke mental health struggles down to everyday problems, not clinical depression on day one, not chronic trauma or, or anxiety, but the small things that we all can relate to, right? So when we wake up feeling lousy, when we have a certain worry, when we don't hear back from our, our loved ones after some time, these are things we can relate to we brought it back home to what we can relate to. So these are two key things, increasing awareness and lowering the barriers to care. Well, how we did this actually. So one of the most important things towards the last segment of what I'd like to, to touch on is that everyone has a part to play in tackling and changing the mental health pandemic in Asia. It starts with you, right? It starts with all of us. No matter whether you're a student, an employee, a manager, or a leader in any organization, there is different things we can all do with us. Firstly, from the individual. All of us need to start normalizing conversations as we just spoke about. Be more open. Don't feel fearful of what, what there could be. Everyone relates to the struggles that you and I have as well, right? So all of us can empower being a listening ear, can empower ourselves talking more openly about it at your own pace to really normalize how we view mental health. For people in a workplace, um, when you have peers struggling, or if you're a manager and you can spot people in distress, play a part. Lend them a listening ear, offer support, and be empathetic and not judgmental. And last but not least, people who are leaders in companies, organizations, or, or schools even, there's a big part where we can change mental health um, matters from a top-down perspective as well. How can we drive more support, more, more, more empathy, more, more investment in, in actually Pushing for mental health care and mental support, it's a big thing that we all can do. And it all starts with us, right? So that's the key thing I like to do. Normalizing conversations and changing how each of us can access care. And we all have a part to play. So that's a big part of what I'd like to cover today. Every one of us today 
is going through a mental pandemic. It's looming. It won't be an angle that we, we strive to, but a constant movement that we believe everyone could actually support and, and play at. So to wrap it all up, we can solve the mental pandemic together. We need to acknowledge that this is going on and eventually ensure that we all play a part to change how we see and view mental health. Thank you very much.